Hey, welcome to Red Door Church Christmas Eve online experience. We're so glad that you're joining us wherever you may be watching and tuning in. Uh, we're glad that you're with us celebrating and reflecting on Christmas this, together this year. Uh, my name is Zach Pastor here at Red Door Church. We're glad that you're with us. Red Door Church is based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, one church with multiple expressions, and uh, we're glad that you're with us. I want to start off with a question, just to get, jump into this celebration as, as we prepare for Christmas, as um, we get ready for all the festivities and food and presents and time with family. I want to ask you this question as we begin this time. Uh, what gets you in the mood for Christmas? Now, I, I know this might be a loaded question. This may be a tricky question, uh, maybe a controversial question, but what gets you into the mood for Christmas? Maybe think back to your childhood, maybe something you do with your family. Maybe it's a, a thing that you experience every year, but I want you to think about what gets you in the mood for Christmas. Uh, looking at some studies and, and kind of doing some surveys, we asked the question to a bunch of people, what gets you in the mood for Christmas? And, and they gave us kind of top five things. And I want to look at a few of these. Again, none of these are in any particular order, but one of the first things that people said that gets them in the, in the mood for Christmas is music, right? Music has that way about just triggering feelings and emotions, takes you back to times when you were younger, takes you back to, to moments in life that kind of almost kind of rehearse those experiences and expressions as you grew up. Music has this great way of kind of hitting those beats and those tunes, and it kind of triggers kind of that feeling of Christmas. Uh, maybe it's, you know, the warm, fuzzy feelings of Christmas. It's the holiday cheer, whatever it may be. But music many times is kind of one of those things that triggers the mood for Christmas. Some of the surveys said that top five music that people listen to is uh, by Bing Crosby, White Christmas. Maybe you're familiar with that. Or The Christmas Song by Nat King Cole. Or Holly Jolly Christmas by Bert Ives. Um, or The Most Wonderful Time of the Year by Andy Williams. Whatever it may be, maybe it's Joy to the World or Silent Night. As soon as you hear that beat hit, as soon as you hear that song, it triggers that feeling of Christmas. Maybe it's that security. Maybe it's that warm, fuzzy feeling of just feeling happy and excited. But music is really one of those things. The second one is this, is movies, okay? Movies have a way to trigger the mood and get you excited about the holidays. Uh, whether it's a classic cartoon or a classic Christmas movie, it gets you in the holiday uh, spirit. As a kid, I, I remember always kind of the week leading up to Christmas, we would try to watch a Christmas movie, a classic Christmas movie each night as you kind of prepare and whether it's a comedy or a cartoon or a classic, there's something about a Christmas movie that just gets you excited about the holidays. Some of my favorite movies are It's a Wonderful Life, again, one of the most classic Christmas movies. My personal favorite is The Christmas Story, uh, again, with Ralphie and You're Gonna Shoot Your Eye Out uh, is one of those classic movies that I love. Uh, White Christmas is another one that many people said, or uh, Christmas Vacation is a popular one, or Miracle on 34th Street, or in our house, our favorite one is Elf, okay? It's one of those movies that you just watch every year to get you ready for Christmas. The number three idea that kind of triggers a lot of holiday uh, feelings, uh, mood, gets you in the mood for Christmas is drinks, okay? Again, some companies, I won't name names, but some have made uh, millions of dollars on specialty drinks during Christmas. Refreshment during Christmas gets it's kind of an integral part of tasting Christmas, okay? So my favorite, again, some people don't like this, but I love me a good eggnog, right? Now, eggnog is not something you drink on 4th of July. It's not something you drink when it's sunny or warm out, but it's one of those kind of nice holiday drinks that's fattening, it's full, it's thick. It just makes me think of Christmas and winter and, and all the things that come with it. Maybe you're a hot chocolate fan. Maybe that's hot chocolate with marshmallows or candy cane dipped in it. Um, my wife's favorite, you know, obviously is the pumpkin spice latte or the peppermint or spearmint type of mocha drinks from, you know, the Bucks, you know, you know where I'm talking about. Those are really popular during Christmas, or maybe you're just a classic with the old uh, hot apple cider, right? Something that just screams fall. It kind of brings out all those f flavors of the winter and holidays, but drinks I think are an integral part of kind of getting you in the mood. 
The fourth one is this, which is probably some of us, my most dreaded part of Christmas is shopping, right? Now today we have online Amazon that you don't even have to leave your house or get dressed. You can order anything you want, but shopping is one of those things that gets people in the mood. The kind of that Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, it's shopping time. Everything kind of is crazed. It's kind of that time that you go out and look for something special for your loved ones. What's interesting is there are stores that have talked about this over the years of using during shopping uh, certain scents, uh, smells that trigger emotional feelings and actually get people to purchase more or get more excited about the holiday uh, shopping spree. Uh, they actually call it sensory marketing. Okay, It's a whole new thing that's out there is how can they pipe in certain smells that trigger the senses, the sensory, the smelling, the feelings that come with that to get people to purchase or be happier, which then ultimately leads to more sales. Uh, stores use things like uh, fresh cook cookies baked, orange, uh, kind of cinnamon orange, or even uh, the smell of pine. I've all been triggered and used by scientists to say that these create emotional reactions while shopping to buy more things. So if you're at the store next time and you smell you know, peppermint or you smell freshly baked cookies, they might be piping that in to get you to purchase more things. Uh, this year they say that holiday shopping actually in the U.S., um, Holiday shopping accounts for 30% of all retail sales in a year. So all the sales, 30% of the sales in a year are all done during the holiday season. They say the period between December 15th and Christmas Eve tonight uh, will account for 40% of all Christmas sales. So think about that. The last week and a half, two weeks of holiday is the number one shopping time for most people. And they say in the U.S. this year, even with pandemic and everything going on, that Americans will spend $160 plus billion plus on Christmas this year. And so shopping many times gets people in the mood to get out and shop, find things for people that you love, and that gets you in the mood for Christmas. And the last thing that I think is probably one of the most classic things that gets you in the mood is Christmas lights. It's decorating, it's Christmas lights, it's going out and looking at Christmas lights. There's something about seeing people decorate their houses and something about decorating your tree that just gets you excited about the holidays. I can remember as a kid, some of my most favorite traditions is Christmas Eve, getting a cup of hot chocolate and going out and looking at Christmas lights. I remember the decorating and setting up the tree that were some of the most special things ever. In and anticipation for Christmas is all the things that are decorated, all the things you do leading up to Christmas just kind of get you really motivated and excited as a kid. You just can't wait for that Christmas. You continually ask your parents, can I, how much longer can I open presents? Can I open just one present? All of it kind of gets you into this exciting mood. You see, Christmas is special, okay? It's a special holiday. However, the very first Christmas, it wasn't as special as you would think, okay? The very first Christmas was actually very unconventional and ordinary. And it's ordinary though, is where we find the beauty of what Christmas is all about. I want to read from Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. We're just going to read a few verses here and look at one thought tonight as we celebrate and reflect on Christmas. The book of Luke says this in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for the entire Roman Empire. This was the first census that pl took place while Quirinius, uh, the governor of Syria, was in rule. Everyone went to his own town to register. So, Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth, to the town in Galilee, to Judea, and to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now I want to just look at this little quick passage here. I want to rewind nine months before this, the moment that young Mary was visited by an angel. Mary, who was a teenager, she was a young single woman uh, engaged to be married to Joseph. One night an angel came to her and it says this in Luke chapter one, the angel said, you Mary will be with child and you will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary is this young woman 
in a dream, an angel comes and says, you will give birth to a child. She's engaged to be married. She finds out she's pregnant. She's young. She has no money. And now months later, we find this story as she and Joseph are traveling. She's pregnant with her first child. And just when things can't get any more difficult, the ruler Caesar orders a decree that a census be taken. Now, if you don't understand this, that a census was one of those things that a governing ruler would call to basically count up all the people in the entire empire for one sole purpose so that they could have an accurate number of who to tax and how much money they could collect from people. And so you had to go back to your birthplace, back to your original home, and you would travel there to go and report and register. Now imagine a young teenage mom, pregnant with her first child, now has to travel back to be registered. When Sarah and I first moved to Sioux Falls, which has been over eight years ago now, we had our two daughters and we were pregnant with our third child, our son, Roman. And we moved to South Dakota in the middle of summer, July 1st, 2012, traveled, left all of our family and friends, didn't know a single person in South Dakota. We moved all the way across the state into Sioux Falls, not knowing a single person. It was one of the summers that was one of the most hottest, most humid summers in record for South Dakota. And my wife, who was pregnant, was absolutely miserable. <laughs> I had taken all of our friends. We had left all of our family and friends. We'd come to a new place. We had two kids, one on the way. It was hot out. She was pregnant with her third child, and she was miserable. Now, you can remember if you've ever been pregnant or been around someone, it's one of those times that can be very trying and very difficult. And I would say it wasn't easy for me, but she would probably want to hurt me because it affected me in no way. She had to carry the way. She had to carry this child. She had to give birth. She had to do all the work. And, and I was just kind of the tag along in this. But I remember just all the difficulties that went along with this child, carrying, giving birth. And, and as you get later into the pregnancy, the more difficult it is. And so we find Mary in the story who you can imagine was not happy to have to travel to go register. Now, Mary and Joseph uh, were Jews living in really a, a conquered people group. They were um, conquered. They were not really held captive, but they were part of the Roman Empire. They had to obey the rules of Rome. And we find them as Caesar issues this census to come and to count. And so Mary and Joseph, knowing that they have to go register, uh, they loaded up their donkey and began to walk. And most scholars believe that for Mary and Joseph, it was 90 plus miles that they had to travel to go register. Now, I think all of us could have some sympathy for Mary, okay? She's probably almost nine months pregnant. She's carrying this child that's hot out. They're traveling on donkey, 90 plus miles. It's not like a car today where you jump in there and you're there in an hour and a half. This took days to get there. All the while, she's traveling with her child. Now, you can just imagine how much difficulty this was uh, to go about. But we find as they are there, as they're there to register, Mary goes into labor and gives birth to Jesus. However, because of all the traveling of people coming back for the census, the scholars and scripture tells us that there were so many people in the city that there was actually no room for them to stay. There was no family members, no friends, no hotel rooms, nothing was available. In fact, it says that the only place that they could find was a manger, which all scholars believe that this was not, you know, a nice you know, Motel 6, Super 8, Holiday Inn, hotel room. This was literally a stable where animals were kept. As families were staying in the inn, as they were being housed and, and hospitable, their animals were kept safe in a stable. They were fed and well taken care of while they stayed there. And this was the only place available for Mary and Joseph, this young teenage couple, uh, given this task uh, to, to carry this child and she goes into labor. Now, I know my wife, and I can't imagine this scenario, how stressful, how difficult, how overwhelming this would be. Mary finds herself in labor and giving birth to her son, Jesus. Now, this Christmas scene, again, is not one that is many times displayed on a Hallmark Christmas card or on a mantle on your fireplace. We've kind of beautified it. We've changed it up a little bit to make it look spectacular. And it is spectacular. But in reality, when you strip away all that, you see that the story was actually a bit of a disaster. The Christmas story, this first Christmas, 
would be considered a disaster. It was filled with chaos and difficulty and, and challenges and trials. It was anything but perfect. It was anything but beautiful. But in the midst of this, something amazing happens. If we look at this story just in a kind of a quick glimpse, we see that Jesus, the son of David, the, the savior of the world, the Messiah, was born in an animal stable next to some donkeys and horses. Jesus was born. Now, not, not a, a place for a king to be born. Jesus was born to a teenage single mother who was engaged to be married, a young teenage mother. Jesus was visited by a bunch of misfit shepherds who were considered crooks and swindlers, were the ones that were notified first and came to see this baby. And Jesus eventually grew up in a carpenter's house in the town of Bethlehem that was known for a bad reputation in Nazareth, is what I mean. We see that Jesus' story isn't something that is beautifully displayed in a Hallmark card or on your mantle, but it was something that was probably considered chaotic, overwhelming, and a bit of a disaster, a bit messy. But all of it was done with purpose. It wasn't by accident that Mary and Joseph were called to a census. It wasn't by accident that Jesus was born in a barn. It wasn't by accident that Jesus had a bunch of shepherds come and visit. It was for a purpose. The awaited Savior and Messiah came into the world without all this hype and grandeur, but instead as ordinary. What I love about the term ordinary, we don't use it a whole lot, but the word ordinary actually comes back to this idea of with no special quality, no interests, commonplace, and unexceptional. Now, you don't put those two words together that Jesus, the Savior of the world, the King, is ordinary. But Jesus chose to come to you and I in an ordinary time, in an ordinary place, as an ordinary baby, with the purpose of doing something amazing. See, what I want you to understand tonight as we reflect on the night before Christmas is that Jesus meets you and I in the ordinary. Jesus meets you and finds you in the ordinary. Jesus finds us in the midst of the mess and the chaos and all the disaster and brokenness in our lives. Jesus seeks and finds us and meets us right where we're at. Jesus didn't come just to be adored and he didn't come just to figure out what it was like to be a man, but he came, it says, to seek and to save you and I. And he did that by coming as ordinary. In Matthew 1, we see the angel sharing to Mary what is going to happen. And he says to Mary, he says, you will bear a son and you shall call him his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The beauty in this is that Jesus, the Savior of the world, came to you and I in the ordinary to give us life. I want to close just with this last little thought as we reflect again and celebrate on Jesus and what Christmas is all about. I think many of us today in our day and age and our culture and our lives probably relate more with Mary and Joseph than anyone else. We find ourselves in a similar spot. We find ourselves in chaos. We find ourselves in brokenness and messiness and in difficult times and questioning and wondering what's going to happen and, and how are we going to get through this and what's going to happen of this beyond this and what about my kids and what about my job and, and all these things that we go through is very similar to Mary and Joseph finding themselves in the midst of chaos and disaster. Jesus shows up and I love this because that is what it's all about is in the midst of all of our pain, midst of our disasters, midst of our brokenness, messiness, and chaos, Jesus shows up. He finds us in the midst of this difficulty, and he brings us peace. Jesus was the awaited Messiah, the one that had been told about hundreds of years before this. He arrives, not with trumpets blaring and banners blasting and news everywhere, but he came to a single teenage daughter, in a barn with no hype, no grandeur, but ordinary. As we reflect on Christmas and celebrate Christmas, I want us to take comfort in knowing that our Savior Jesus Christ finds you and I in the ordinary. He comes to us in the messy, in the difficult, 
in the chaos of life, and he offers us new life through him. He doesn't say fix all this and, and get this stuff figured out first then. He says, no, come to me now, right where you're at, in the midst of the mess and the brokenness, and I will bring peace, I'll bring hope, and I'll bring new life for you. Jesus comes to us in the ordinary. I would like to close this in prayer and pray for you wherever you may be watching. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every person tuning in and listening this Christmas Eve. We ask that in the midst of our chaos, our disasters, our difficulties, that we can take comfort knowing that you are with us. In fact, your name means God with us. And we're not in this alone. We're not in this by ourselves, but you're standing there with us to comfort and to lead us. And you came in the ordinary to seek and to save us. We love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to bless you. Have a great Christmas. And we hope that God will bring comfort and peace to you wherever you're at. God bless you.